I'm Alfonso Mendoza, host of the My Ed Tech Life podcast, a part of the Education Podcast Network. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Hey, welcome back. Steve here. And today I'm talking with Karen Gazit, PhD, and we're focused on her book, The Power of Effective Reading Instruction. How Neuroscience Informs Instruction Across All Grades and Disciplines. Oh, you're going to love this talk, and you're going to learn so much. It's so cool. Thanks for listening. Oh, oh, by the way, before you go, it'd be so cool if, you know, you shared the podcast with a friend of yours, a colleague, somebody you you know hasn't listened to it yet, and you say, hey, I I got a podcast for you to listen to. That would be awesome. Another way you could help out the podcast would be by leaving a review at stephenmaletto.com slash reviews and and say some nice words. Uh, Another way would be by uh, um, joining my email list. Just do that by the little box that's on the front page. Uh, and another thing that you could do would be to buy me a cup of coffee or a soda. That that link's on that front page, and you go there, and you could donate a dollar or two to help me keep my gear up to date, help me pay the bills of the different programs that I use, and uh, things like that uh, to help support this free podcast. That would be greatly appreciated. Uh, you're awesome. Enjoy the show. So you can use it for reading. You can use it in other areas as well. In my case, what I was so interested in is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, for reading. So you're able to identify when children are reading, basically what you look at is the level of oxygenated blood that goes to specific regions of the brain when children are engaged in reading. It's the Education Podcast, your favorite show, with lots of groovy guests and they share what they know. So crank it up the tin and let your neighbors know that here's another show with Dr. Steve Miletto. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Teaching, learning, leading, K-12. Ah, ah, with Dr. Steve Miletto. Karen Gazit, Ph.D., is a faculty lecturer in the Department of Educational and Counseling Psychology at McGill University, where she also serves as the Graduate Program Director for the Certificate of Inclusive Education and is the ECP Liaison for the Office of First Nations and Inuit Education Certificate Program. From 2018 to 2020, Dr. Gazit served as the Academic Project Leader for McGill University Faculty of Education's Determining Best Practice for Students with Learning Challenges in Quebec, Comprehensive Review and Knowledge Mobilization. She is also the author of Teaching with Purpose, How to Thoughtfully Implement Evidence-Based Practices in Your Classroom. She serves additionally as a director of the Bronfman Jewish Education Center of Federation, CJA. She holds a strong belief that teachers play a critical role in the success of their students, and she has presented worldwide on topics related to developing key competencies in leadership, inclusive education, evidence-based practices, and assessment and instruction. Dr. Gazit began her teaching career at the Feuerstein Institute in Jerusalem, where she implemented Dr. Feuerstein's Instrumental Enrichment Program for Young Children and Adolescents. She has taught at Hebrew College in Boston and the University of New Brunswick as well. And she is also the recipient of many awards from the likes of Scottish Rite Foundation and the FFCR from the Quebec Ministry for PhD Research. We got a lot to talk about today because our focus is on her book, The Power of Effective Reading Instruction, How Neuroscience Informs Instruction Across All Grades and Disciplines. Karen, thanks so much for being on the show and say hi to everyone. Hi, everybody, and thank you for having me. Well, glad to have you here. What a cool book you've written. I, I, I love this. And I, you know, our, book, our, our talk today is focused on your book, The Power of Effective Reading Instruction, How Neuroscience Informs Instruction Across All Grades and Disciplines. So why'd you write this book? Thank you, and great question. Uh, I teach a graduate course uh, at McGill. I've been teaching the course for a number of years. Also worked in the school system forever since I started my educational career. But specifically teaching this course and doing workshops on reading, the number of times I heard teachers say, why, didn't en- why don't I know this? Why didn't anybody teach me this? This is so basic. I'm a grade one teacher. I'm a grade two teacher. I'm a grade nine teacher or ninth grade, I think is you know how, how it's said in the States. And uh, it really, you know, I, I had all of these ideas in my head from teaching the course and just said, let me put it down because I'm so passionate about kids learning how to read and learning how to read effectively. That is awesome. It, it, and it's, it's cool because, 
I mean, not only do you have this idea to create this book, but you made this book. All right. So, I mean, it's a, it's a nice book and it's, it's got a, thank it's you. easy to read and it's, uh, it's ideas and concepts are easy to comprehend. And uh, so thank you. Uh, kudos on that. So, you know, in the introduction to your book, you note this, since the early 2000s, there has been an abundance of research on reading and you credit functional magnetic resonance imaging. Could you talk about this? Sure. So magnetic resonance imaging is basically using magnetic fields to image the body. So what is functional magnetic resonance imaging? It is, it's, it's a very large machine where you are able to identify the areas of the brain that are being activated when individuals, and in the case, in my case, specifically children, the areas of the brain that are activated when they're engaged in reading. So you can use it for reading, you can use it in other areas as well. In my case, what I was so interested in is fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging, for reading. So you're able to identify when children are reading, basically what you look at is the level of oxygenated blood that goes to specific regions of the brain when children are engaged in reading. What is very, very interesting, and this has been fascinating research, like I said, that started you know, a number of decades ago, there's a specific part of the brain that needs to be activated when children are doing their early reading, their decoding. And it's specifically parietal temporal regions in, in the, the midbrain of the left hemisphere. And when children with a reading difficulty uh, attempt to read, what the fMRI has shown is that they're activating parts of the right hemisphere, which indicates that they're not, in fact, decoding the word, but they're looking at the word as though it's a full image, which is very problematic to reading development. What an awesome way to learn about this, because, you know, one of the things that uh, is amazing to me is that the without this technology and without somebody paying attention to what it can also share, <laughs> because it does lots of, there's lots of things that they're looking at. I would think, you know, you know as you're looking at reading and, and things that interfere with it and what might be helpful and so forth. I mean, I, you're talking to someone who um, a year and a half ago, I had to have brain surgery and I had, uh. and how they f discovered that I needed the surgery was because I was complaining about not being able to hear out of my one ear and after I went through a whole blevy of doctors <laughs> that eventually led me to the people who uh, use this type of stuff, they showed me where on the MRI you could see that there should be activity in this one area, but there was none. Whereas on this side to the ear, there was activity. And that was what led them to, to know pretty much what they, and then, then they showed me the little white ball that was right there that shouldn't be there. And uh, it's fascinating. I'm sorry to hear, but it's, it is fascinating research. It yeah. is. It's amazing. And that's why it was one of the things when you start talking about that, that's why I had to bring it up because yeah, I'm fascinated by, I mean, I, I will never hear out of that ear, but they, it stopped it from destroying lots of things that it could have done. And yeah. uh, they, uh, and, and so I only, it's just amazing to me what they can learn from looking at these images and uh, that people, you know, before would not have known, I guess that's my point. So, yeah, absolutely. So very, very cool that this is, uh, I, I just thought that was neat that you credited absolutely. this ability. And just one other thing. I mean, it, it's been so important, you, you know, these are not lazy, unmotivated kids, right? These are kids who we, we have clear evidence that there are reasons why they are struggling to learn how to read. That's, it's so awesome. Yeah, because that's, <laughs> unfortunately, that happens. You know, adults make judgments like that and, um many cases, especially like this, wrongly so. So there might be something else going on. Uh, early in the beginning of your book, The Power of Effective Reading Instruction, you comment this. As students learn to read, they need to gradually consolidate the visual and language networks into one that enables the reader to become proficient at reading sophisticated text with ease and comprehension. But for young readers, these networks are not yet consolidated. Now, I found this very fascinating. Um, could you talk about why this is important for a teacher to know? Sure. So to start off, language is natural. We just have to make sure that kids are, are 
in an environment, a language rich environment, and they will learn how to speak. Reading is not natural. You have to learn how to read. It has to be taught well, it has to be learned. So because of that, because it's not natural, the brain has had to do what's called neurorecycling or use other elements of the brain that were not initially tasked for reading to be able to read. So there are, you know, we have a visual cortex which enables us to see images. In this case, the child will see the word or the letter and what they need to eventually be able to do is make the association between that visual squiggly thing on a page that forms other squiggly things that forms a word, they need to be able to consolidate that visual letter and word into the individual sounds from our language system. So there's a consolidation between the visual system and the language-based system, which gives meaning to each of the letters. So that in order to read, children must consolidate each squiggly line to have the information that's carried on it, which is the sound that that letter makes. So we consolidate that visual system and the language system, which is the sound-based structure for each letter. In order to read, children have to form that consolidation that every letter, in fact, makes a specific sound. Eventually, you have, you know, squiggly lines and the child's ability to speak, but speaking is, in essence, those sounds that are associated with, with each of the letters. So that consolidation is critical. And you asked an important question. So why do teachers need to know that? So the critical piece here is, number one, reading is not natural. Speaking is, reading is not. In order for kids to learn how to read, they have to create that consolidation, which is the, the meaning or the understanding that every letter carries a sound associated with it. And in order to read, they need to form that association so that they know the letter information carried or the sound information that's carried on each distinct letter. And eventually that process, it begins pretty, uh, you know, in a, in a sort of sloppy, not sloppy so much, but it's deliberate, it's difficult for them to learn the sound of each letter. It's laborious, it's a slow process as they match the letter to the sound. But in order to be proficient at reading, that process must eventually become automatic. Once it becomes automatic, in essence, you're no longer decoding. You almost can't help yourself from reading. Once you become proficient, you've learned, you've consolidated that visual image with the sound that represents it. And then you learn to do that process quickly and automatically and fluently so that all of your focus and information could now be spent on understanding what you're reading that comprehension piece. That's so cool. Cause it, it, you know, at what ages are we talking about that this is kind of typical that it's going sure. on? Sure. So yeah, I, I mean, these are, these are wonderful questions. So very, very early on when kids are three years old, a very important early indication that a child has the foundation or, you know, what they need to eventually create that map between the letter and the sound is rhyming. Rhyming is absolutely essential. Uh, so around three years old, when you read them a rhyming book, they should laugh, which indicates that they are able to pick up that sound structure of language. There are many other elements, but rhyming is a critical one. And then when they, you know, when they're four years old, event, uh, around four years old, they should be able to generate rhyming words. So you give them a word, you give them, you know, you, you make sure they understand what rhyming means, and they should be able to generate a whole bunch of rhyming words. When kids don't pick up on words that rhyme and have difficulty generating rhyming words, we say it puts it means that they're at risk. We have to pay very close attention. It is a, a risk factor. When they're, you know, when they're around five years old, they start to understand that there is a map between the letter and the sound. And they need to start learning the sounds that all the letters make. So that when they move into grade one, they begin actually decoding these very, very simple words. 
when they move into grade two, they develop that, we say consonant, vowel, consonant words like dog. They, you know, develop that ability to decode those simpler words. And then in grade two, they start reading those more multisyllabic words. They have to start learning these orthographic patterns and the exceptions that exist. And grade three, that becomes a little bit more, you know, challenging in the sense of what they're reading is more, uh, you know, less patterned, more exceptions, so that they're then able to thoroughly enjoy, without putting too much focus on the decoding, thoroughly enjoy and learn from the act of reading. Yeah, it's, it's so powerful, and especially in understanding that, because I, I would think that it really makes you understand that there could be a lot more to what's going on if they're not, or if they're struggling with um, those little squiggly lines and the symbols and the sounds and all that. Right. And very important to mention is that reading is an auditory skill. It's not a visual skill. Nice. Right. It really is the ability to break language into its parts and map language onto these sounds. So or as a, onto these letters that represent them. Gotcha. So as a note, the good thing is we weren't recording beforehand as, uh, as Karen was helping me understand how to say um, certain words that uh, I did not uh, know how to say that it's, it's funny because we literally were going through that process. I think that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah, very cool. Very cool. So, uh, all right. So in chapter five, you share the big five phonemic awareness, phonics, vocabulary, fluency, and comprehension. Could you talk about the role of importance these play in learning to read? And obviously there's something very important about them because you call them the big five. So big five, right. So I, I, I didn't label it the big five. I would love to take the credit for it, but uh, and you know, the, the history is in the book. I don't think it's important now in this, but it, you know, it was labeled or, you know, early two thousands as the big five, because these are the essential building blocks. And these are the elements that must be included in every literacy based classroom from, you know, early childhood, right through to, um, to high school, and you could say even adult education. Um, and, the, you know, they're building blocks. And the first one is phonemic awareness. In formal education, they have to know the sounds that all the letters make. So, it, you know, you can do it with your eyes closed. And in, in essence, you're not yet reading, but you have to be able to break a word into its parts. So phonemic awareness is the awareness that, for example, dog is made up of three sounds, d, a, g. And in order to read, I have to be able to segment that word because I'm going to need to map each of those sounds onto other words, um, like dazzle. So the child needs to be able to clearly segment each of the sounds that they hear in a word, then blend them and isolate different sounds but phonemic awareness, a phoneme is an individual sound. And phonemic awareness is the awareness that words are made up of individual sounds and the ability to break that word into the sounds and put them back together. So that's foundational for reading. And that's heavy emphasis in early childhood, in kindergarten. And phonics is the next one. Phonics is the mapping of the letter to the sound that it represents. So now we're moving beyond just the sound, and now we're moving into that mapping of the letter and the sound that it represents. In other words, children are now decoding. So we present them with letters. There is, and I, I present it in the book, there is a specific format that's helpful in terms of introducing letter sounds. We start with letters that are continuous, like which is an easier letter than B, which disappears. Um, and, you know, we, we teach them a sequence of letters and the sounds that map onto that letter. And that, again, is, is the decoding. And we teach them each of the sounds, and then we teach them digraphs, and we have to also teach them exceptions. Um, what I like to say, as soon as children are able to map a letter to a sound, even when they read very simple words, I'll say, you are now a reader. This is exactly what readers do, so that they begin to develop that identity of themselves as readers. Uh, so that's phonics. Vocabulary, in order to read and understand what you're reading, 
you have to have the language. So this is something that we need to begin teaching. We don't have to wait until grade two, grade three. We have to start the minute uh, an infant is born, we need to start developing vocabulary. The only difference here in terms of the big five is that we have to be a lot more explicit in vocabulary instruction. There's incidental vocabulary just from living in the world and, you know, speaking to people. But, you know, from an academic school-based perspective, we have to be a lot more purposeful in teaching vocabulary. So we have to make sure that they have the language necessary to be able to read different types of texts. And again, that doesn't need to wait until they've mastered reading. We can teach them vocabulary very, very early on. And, you know, obviously this is something we begin the minute the infant is born, as I said. Then the fluency. Fluency is what we say, it's the bridge between decoding and comprehension. Because in order to fully understand what you're reading, you have to read fluently, which means reading quickly, without error, and with proper cadence or rhythm. If I am going to put all my emphasis on understanding what I'm reading, the actual decoding or the act of reading has to be quite simple, can't be laborious. So in order for me to develop sophisticated reading comprehension, I have to be reading fluently, not laboriously. I can no longer be decoding every word. So that's the fluency piece. And comprehension, you know, refers to the, the pinnacle of reading, which is the reason why we read the ability to understand the texts that we're reading. So those, those are the big five. I appreciate that. And, it, and as I'm listening to you, one of the things, especially early on when you're talking, the, uh, um, it makes me think about when my oldest just turned 30. But uh, when both my kids uh, were young, the, uh, the, the youngest is now getting ready to be 27. And so you kind of get an I- idea there. But uh, it, was just, it was just funny experiences that you have um, when you know, your child suddenly says from the, you know, the kid's seat behind you as they're looking out and they look at a truck that's just gone by, and they sound out the word. And it's like, what does this Amazing. mean? And it's a, it's a cool thing because it's like, what are you looking at? And you realize they're, you know, and in my case, the first time we had that happen, it was a Sears truck, um, you know, the, the retailer going by. And he's like, what's Sears? And he says something like that. And it's, what's Sears, it. what are you looking at? It's That's like, the decoding piece. Right. And it's, it's enjoyable for kids who learn how to do it. You can imagine for kids who are struggling they look around them and they say, well, wait a second, you know, whether they articulate it or not, but they certainly feel like everybody is doing something that they are struggling to do. That's so important. And you also mentioned something else that made me think about, you know, some of what you're talking about there in, in recognizing patterns or the rhyming, helping all that stuff. It kind of, uh, uh, you know, I've read a lot about some of this different research and some of it about the importance of involving them in talks or like singing with kids, like in the bathtub or something like that. And I, I used to sing, you know, my, my background in, in uh, songs that I would choose from are old TV shows. And uh, so one of the songs I would sing was the theme to Gilligan's Island. Uh, I, I was, I was, you know, for those of you who are listening, we're or aging young, ourselves. Yes. For those of you who are listening and don't know what I'm talking about, it's, you know, a few people stranded on an Island, look it up. And, uh, and then, uh, and then I also would sing the, the theme song to Beverly Hilly, uh, Be- Beverly Hillbillies. And uh, one time my, my son was asking, he's like, Dad, what's Texas Teeth? And I said, Texas Teeth? And he's like, yeah, you know, you sing that song and you go, and he starts singing it back to me and he goes, Texas Teeth. And I said, oh, that's Texas Tea. <laughs> you know, oil. <laughs> but that's it. That's playing around with sounds. I mean, that's that's so important. Language and sounds and how sounds are, you know, built together to form meaning wonderful very important so cool because it really shows you it really explains to you why you know taking time to do those things can really so pay off um so talk a little bit about some of the barriers for a child learning to read what what so what some of that stuff? uh sure so there there are barriers that uh, you know, that are inherent in, in kids. For example, you know, we know that there is a percentage of children who do struggle to read. And there are specific reasons that I really try and go through in the book in terms of challenges, actual, you know, fascinating research to the extent of limited white and gray matter 
has been found in specific regions of the you know parietal temporal regions of the left hemisphere, the specific part of the brain responsible for breaking language into its parts and the mapping, as I said. So, you know, there are specific challenges, but you know, I, I am extremely uh, you know optimistic and glass half full with good instruction. Everybody could learn how to read, could become a proficient reader, just that we need to identify the difficulty uh, early on and uh, provide them with support. So there are specific challenges, but there are other challenges, I would say, in the school system, and that is we need to identify early on. So we have to be doing the in-school screening. There are lots of screening tools that teachers can use to identify if, if kids are developing their foundational skills early on. One of the most important things to look at can can kids read nonsense words? If they can't read nonsense words, words that they've never seen before, then perhaps they are visualizing the entire word and not decoding. So we really should be giving kids, you know, right in grade one, nonsense words to be reading. And if they say to you, I can't read that word, I've never seen it before, it's an indication that they're not actually decoding. Um, so effective instruction is critical. The first thing I had mentioned is those challenges, you know, that there are kids who struggle to read. We need to do the screenings early on and identify it. But from a curricular perspective or methodology in the classroom, we have to use evidence-based practice. You asked me early on why I wrote the book. So one of the reasons was we know so much about evidence-based, science-based teaching. And there's so much out there, you know, we call it the war on reading and should we use this approach? There's so much there about how to teach kids how to read. And it is critical that teachers learn about and apply evidence-based teaching practices in the classroom. So, you know, there are barriers that come from just not having those evidence-based practices. Um, it, you know, there are things that are flying out there like balanced literacy that we know is not evidence-based. But we need to know that and we need to know what is evidence-based practice. How do we teach kids how to read? And those are the kinds of practices that have to be applied. That's why we spoke about the big five. You know, it's so important because I, I, I was listening to a lecturer, um, it seems like just yesterday, it was bunch of years ago. But one of the things he talked about was he was focused on how, you know, a lot of times he was comparing schools to uh, a hurricane in that up top is where all the research is talked about and argued about and no, you're right. No, I'm wrong. That type of thing. Or you're wrong. I'm right. That type of thing's going on. But then at the bottom of the ocean in a hurricane, you know, it's calm. It's not as not like the top. And a lot of times, and he compared that to the classroom. And what he was saying was that a lot of times all the research going on it eventually, maybe some of it gets to the classroom. I mean, and it's interesting what you said, because it's so important for the practitioners to, to know why they need to do what they're doing. Absolutely. Phonics is essential. We have to teach kids the sounds of all the letters, teach them how to put these sounds together to form words, build it gradually, increase the challenge. Um, but not it's not a guessing game. There's no part of this. You know, I mean, every now and again, there's certain words that don't follow clear rules, but appear very frequently in text. So maybe we show them that word. But, you know, reading is not a guessing game. It's called decoding. For there, It's a code. And we have to teach children what that code is. Um, and we don't want kids to guess. And we don't want to show them pictures and have them guess what the word is or teach them how to use any cues outside of just decoding teach them the sounds of the letters and build that gradually and develop the fluency and the comprehension. So there's no guessing. It's, it is, like I said, decoding. And that's critical. I love that. That's, uh, you know, and just enough for my listeners. I mean, one of the things um, it, you're going to need to get her book because I'm not going to go you know, <laughs> page by page here. There's all so kinds of cool stuff here that Karen's provided. So, you know, in chapter three, you share, during the early years of school, st students learn to read, but once they begin the middle grades, they read to learn. What does this look like, and why is it important to recognize? And I love this section. So in, you know, preschool, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, and even into third grade, 
those are the foundational years for kids learning how to read all the decoding and the beginning of the, you know, that development of, of fluency. Once they move beyond third, fourth grade, the expectation is you now know how to read, you know, the foundations of reading, you're, you're able to decode, you're able to read somewhat fluently. Now, we're really going to focus on the content. Now we're going to read our history book and our science book and our social science geography. And now you need to use the information that you learned about decoding to understand what it is that you're reading. That's the meaning of we learn how to read and then we have to take what we've learned from that early foundational reading and use it now to be able to glean full enjoyment from our reading. We read for enjoyment. We read to learn. Hopefully that's one and the same, not always. But with that foundational knowledge about decoding, we're now able to use that to understand what we're reading, to learn from text. Some research that I cite in the book, if children are not reading by the end of grade three, there's a 75% chance that they will never read at grade level. And that's not because they can't. That's because formal early reading instruction ends by the end of grade two or grade three. So unfortunately, many of them have missed the boat. So now they're in grade four, five, you know, middle school, high school. They're expected to glean information from text, but they, they're not able to read. And that's, that's what, what that means. That is... That is so important and to recognize and know. And I mean, I, I think, you know, it's, it's, it's just so easy to take sides in, in arguments without even knowing what you're, you know, what's, what's there and what's going on and what might be missing. And because, I mean, that's a, that's important to know that once that instruction stops and they still haven't figured it out, that that's a big part of why they're, they're not going to move forward. It's not that they can't learn how to read. It's that, they, they missed it. We didn't pick up early enough that they were struggling. We didn't pick up early enough that they're struggling to read. And kids with a reading difficulty are wonderful at masking the fact that they can't read. They're very good. They, their visual sense is very strong. So they're able to visually memorize words. So they could trick us into thinking that they're reading when in fact they're not. They've just visually memorized and there were lots of, lots of pictures on the page. But then you get to grade four the pictures are gone. The text is more challenging. There's words that they've never seen before. And suddenly the grade five teacher, you know, sort of bangs their head and says, how did nobody pick up on the fact that they're not reading? Um, so that's why we need to do the assessments so that they're not tricking us. We actually know, again, like I said, the nonsense words and some other things we do um, and that teachers can do in the classroom to make sure that kids have their foundational reading skills so that they could, I mean, reading is the gateway, so that they could really glean full um, joy of, of learning beyond that for those foundational years. You know, what's, what's really interesting about what you said, having had the experience of being a, a uh, high school principal in um, s some schools where there were many different uh, um, languages spoken, that one of the things that uh, teachers will sometimes stumble through, which they don't realize until they Catch the kid, because some people listening might say, really, did they, the kids trick you over thinking, oh, yeah. <laughs> Cause, Boy, did they. Yeah, cause especially because they will they figure out the conversational stuff and then make you think that they understand the, you know, trick you into thinking they understand the academic stuff, in which they're, they're, they're miles apart on what they understand. Right, and these are bright kids, right? Really right. bright kids. And they can engage in discussion. They just, they, they struggle to read. And There's one other thing I don't know that I, I, I want to include. I, I was going to bring it up earlier. And I, when you talk about the barriers and it relates to this as well, one of the barriers is, it, you know, we have lots of kids in the upper grades that struggle to read, partly because we didn't identify it early on. And, you know, again, we know that there is going to be quite, you know, a percentage of kids who struggle to read. What happens in the higher grades for these kids is, you know, teacher realizes they're struggling in history and math and geography because they are they can't decode or they're not reading fluently. So we, we do what's called accommodation. We give them automated text. But what's so important, automated text doesn't replace intervention. 
So there are many, you know, I've heard, uh, you know, administrators or, or teachers say, you know, how do you support these non-readers in the upper grades? We accommodate to their needs. We put the books on tape or we give them, you know, automated text for the test, the exam, the novel, et cetera. That is not an intervention. That will not teach them how to read. So that's a good thing to do while we teach them how to read because kids could learn how to read at any age and in any grade level. So I just hope that, you know, we, we understand that while accommodations are important, they don't replace actual teaching kids how to read at any age, at any grade level. I'm not suggesting that the history teacher has to do that, but we have to identify that they're not reading and, you know, get them, get them the intervention, the support that they need. That's awesome. And you just brought up something that it's actually a nice segue into the next question I was going to ask, which is, I mean, could you talk about some support since there are some things that are not that support or seen as that instead, they just kind of maybe help them along, kind of scooch them along or something. Uh, but can you talk about some support or scaffolding that can be used with helping students grow in their skills? Sure. So I, I you know, it depends again, where we are in terms of that, reading trajectory, um, you know, if they're early on. So the, I, I love the concept of scaffolding because, you know, scaffolding means if we look at a scaffold on a building, when the building is weak or falling apart or needs repair, the scaffold is very, very strong. It holds up the building. And as the building is built and gets stronger, the scaffold begins to come down. So the notion of scaffolding from an educational perspective is the teachers give as much support as needed and even then some so that the child feels capable before they're actually capable, which means that we provide a lot of support. We are giving students the support that they need, whether it's their early phonemic awareness or their, you know, their, their decoding, but we're giving them the support that they need if we're teaching them a strategy for comprehension. We are giving them a lot of guidance and a lot of support. And in one of the questions, I'm gonna talk about explicit or direct teaching as well, but we're providing them with a lot of support. And we're only holding, I'll give you an example, if we're teaching students a strategy like cause and effect, we need to give them lots and lots of examples. We need to share with them what goes on in our heads when we engage in comprehension around a cause and effect text structure. So we're sharing our thinking as teachers. We're modeling for them how to do it. It's a very slow process. We model it for them. Then we give them an example of cause and effect. It's very simple. We don't take a history textbook. We say, let's, you know, what happens when you don't study? An example that they're very familiar with. So we build it slowly and gradually and meaningfully so that, you know, one of the things I love to say is the greatest compliment a student can give you is when they roll their eyes. You know, here we go again. It's a compliment because what they're saying is, you've taught me this so many times and so well, I, I hear your voice in my sleep. Nice. And that, I think, the greatest compliment a student can give a teacher, right? So sometimes we go quickly because we think it's boring. It's boring for us. We're adults. It's not boring for kids. So we really need to provide them with a lot of guidance, a lot of modeling and support and gradual mastery before we let go and say, here's the text, here are the questions you need to respond to. You know, as a former uh, administrator who did discipline in building in high schools, um, what a great thing that would be to uh, share with the adult in the classroom and say, um, I just want you to know, if you think of that when they roll their eyes as a wonderful thing, <laughs> because they... Depends why they roll their eyes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I like that. That's awesome. But right. You know what we get? Sometimes they go, they're rolling their eyes. It's offensive. It's not offensive. What right. they're saying is, you taught me well. I, I Like, I, I get it. I'm hearing your voice. Like, you really have been so explicit in your instruction, which is a huge compliment. You know, <laughs> overall, we need to slow down. That is awesome. And, and, yeah. That is, that is awesome because that, and that's something that as an adult is easy to remember too, is that, you know, they, they're telling you, you've said this, you've said this. And, and, and it, our kids say, I know, I know. Well, we taught them well. Yes. I like that. I like that. Uh, all right. So 
Chapter 5 shares a concept in big, bold letters that can be quite controversial. <laughs> um, believe me, I, I've been there as I've heard disagreements with what you said. Um, so the title is this. this, this it, it's All Teachers Are Reading Teachers. Could you share some thoughts about why? In order to be successful, and that's why the subtext of the book is across all grades and disciplines, reading is a gateway. Reading is a gateway. School to life. It it, it is a kid's human right to be able to read. And, of course, we want to make sure that they're successful. Early on, the responsibility is to teach them how to decode in those early grades and move on to fluency. And, of course, vocabulary and comprehension can be taught, you know, from them again, from the moment they're born, we read a story and we talk about what the story is about. But we know that they're, you know, we, we need to develop the foundation, and we need to make sure that they are able to read well and comprehend what they're reading. So, what does it look like for a, you know, a tenth grade history teacher, as an example? If I've identified, and there are many, a student who can't yet decode, and there are many and I'm teaching grade 10 history. It doesn't mean that I have to become an early reading teacher. That's not what it means. What it should mean is I'm going to advocate for that child. I'm going to go out there and say, wait a second. I have a child in my classroom, grade 10, not yet reading or struggling to read. I would love it. I know we have reading experts in the school. Can we help this kid? Can we spend some time going back to the phonics, the sound letter uh, mapping? Can we do that? So number one is to advocate for all kids. Second piece of it is, and it happens beautifully, and when it happens, it's, it's masterful. All teachers have to teach kids how to comprehend text. There are generic strategies for comprehension, just good strategies. And there are discipline-specific strategies. So if I'm a math teacher, I'm teaching math, but math is by and large a language as well. If I'm teaching math, I have to make sure that they understand how to make sense of the problem in math. I have to teach them how to do that. If I'm a a science teacher, I have to make sure it's I'm not only teaching content. I have to make sure that I'm teaching them how to make sense of science text, of history text. It's, it's a unique discipline, right? So there are generic strategies, there are discipline-specific strategies. When I ask my students, and this goes for English teachers as well, or, or, or language teachers, I have to make sure that I'm teaching sophisticated comprehension strategies so that my students, when they go into these other uh, discipline classrooms, they will have those generic strategies to understand what they're reading. So we're all together in this. Um, When we ask kids to answer a question, which we often do, sort of thinking that it's a strategy, answering questions to a text is an assessment. It's not a strategy. We have to teach them how to respond to questions. So many kids, I'm going to take history as an example, they struggle with their, their history text and their history exams because many of them just don't understand what cause and effect is or what problem solution text is, is based on. We have to teach them that. They don't know how to understand questions. So there's some really fundamental reasons why kids are struggling. And that's part of what we need to work on and teach them as teachers of any discipline. So that's what that means. That's awesome. I love it. I have, I just, when I got to that section, I was like, I gotta, I gotta make sure I show lots of people this section. All right. So I, I've had, I've had students in my class that have said to me, you know, I, I'm a math teacher. I'm a high school math teacher. There you go. I am not a reading teacher. We're all reading teachers. We all have to focus. If we're giving kids a math problem, we have to help them comprehend math problems. It makes, How do you do that? So, yeah. Makes so much sense. And we and, can work together, right? English teacher can work with a math teacher. We can, oh. you know, <laughs> figure it out together. <laughs> yes, yes. The, uh, you know, it's, it, it is interesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a former history teacher, and one of the things I used to do is not to blow my horn or something like this, but it's, it, I, I wanted to know if they understood what they were reading, if they were reading what they were supposed to be reading. You know, it's one thing yeah. to say, yeah, 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 I'm going to try and fake it <laughs> until I make it or something. But uh, I would, uh, 
um, you know, literally I had somebody working with them on something else and I'd invite them out in the hallway and they would read a section for me out loud so I could tell great. whether they understood it. And that that's would, great. Can they read it? Can they decode it? Are they reading fluently? Do they understand what they're reading? There's a difference between comprehension and reading comprehension. You may read a text to a student and they understand it perfectly. Their comprehension is fine. But when they read it, right. they struggle. That means that we have to work on the reading, the decoding or the fluency. So, you know, we have to be good detectives. I like that. That's uh, especially, it's so important. I mean, I, but it's, <laughs> I have heard those words, <laughs> what you just uttered just a minute ago. I'm, I'm not a, a reading teacher. I teach this. I teach that. I don't, I'm not a reading teacher. And uh, it's, it's an interesting uh, <laughs> argument or series of arguments that come out of that. So um, good stuff. I love that section. Uh, on page 123, you note this. Teaching strategically means providing the how-to or the steps involved in mastering a skill. Could you talk about why a teacher needs to learn to teach strategically? Sure. So I like to say that strategic teachers give students gifts. What does it mean to give somebody a gift? So if I, I have this wonderful water, water cup made out of glass that I'm holding here. So if I want to give it to you, right, I'm going to hand it over. And the goal is for you to be able to use this cup and drink water or anything else out of the cup independent of me. That is the giving of a gift. So the giving of a gift means that I have taught you how to use a strategy that you can use it independent of me eventually. In other words, if I've taught you how to write an essay effectively and really well, step by step, you will think of me, you'll hear my voice in university because I've taught you so well. I've taught you how to. Master teachers are how-to people. That's what, we, that's what we need to be teaching because when you're teaching a strategy, a skill means you've mastered it and you can get better at it, but you've ma I've mastered driving, I've mastered reading. But the strategy is how do I get there so I will eventually be proficient? And the only way to teach somebody how to master a skill eventually, number one, you have to tell them what it is that they're learning. So it's not a mystery. We have to say, I'm going to teach you how to make sense of text pattern when you read expository text. And this is the reason why I'm teaching. Both of those things are essential. I'm going to tell you what we're doing. If not, how do you know? And I'm going to tell you why it's important so that your brain will go, I better hold on to this because this, I mean, I don't know how to do it yet, but I get that it's important then I'm going to model it. So if we take text pattern and I'm going to teach you cause and effect in a history text, I'm going to model it. So when I model it, I'm explaining, I'm going to go the first thing I do and the second thing I do and the third thing and the fourth thing. And I'm actually sharing my thought process with you. I'm sharing with you my mental model. I'm sharing with you how I think about this and how I engage in the skill, the eventual mastery of the skill, step by step. So I do it first and you listen and you hear me go, here's a text. Here's a short, easy history text. The first thing I do is read the text. The second thing I do is read the text again. The third thing I do is highlight these key words. The fourth thing. So I've now taught you and I say, well, when I get to a text like this, it's difficult. So I'm sharing what's difficult for me. Then I take another easy text and we do it together. So first I did it. Then I'm going to take another one and I want to hear everybody at the same time go. The first thing we do is read it. This, so we do that together as a full class. Then I'm going to take another simple example and I'm going to allow everybody to do it on their own because practice makes permanent. Practice doesn't make perfect. If I do it poorly all the time, I'm going to get very good at doing it poorly. If I play tennis every day badly, I'm going to get very good at playing tennis badly. So I want to give everyone one example. I'm going to walk around the room and I'm going to see if they've got it, if they're able to do it. Sometimes what we do is we teach and then they do many. But if they do many incorrectly or if they haven't gotten how to do it yet, it's breeding frustration. So that also, that's explicit teaching. It relates to the concept of scaffolding, but it's very slow, purposeful. I model, I share my thought process. We do an example. 
you do one by yourself. And if you can't do it, I'm going to help you. And then once I see that you can do one, you got it, you know how, to, now I'm going to ask you to practice many. So you're going to develop automaticity and you're rolling your eyes because you're going, I got this and I'm going way to go. You got this, you got this. So now when you're reading the history textbook on your own without me, I've given you a gift. You now hear my voice in your head and you're able to do it independent of me eventually. It takes time, but it, it, it develops proficiency. It's so cool. Cause that's, you know, that's, it's because like you said earlier, it's a gateway reading is if they don't get yeah. it, if they don't know how to do it, if they fake it, if they're allowed to move on um, and, and then at some point it's going to come back to haunt them. And, right. and that's a scary thing in this world that yeah. is so heavy on us. Yeah. We need to read. Yeah. And we don't want to hold them back a grade, right? I mean, we're not that we just want to identify it early on and give them all the support possible in the classroom so that in those early grades, they've mastered the reading. And if they haven't, it's not too late in grade five, grade six, 10th grade, whenever it is, it's more difficult, but we're going to take the time and make sure, and you know, there are some pretty scary consequences to kids who don't master reading. It's hard for kids and adults who struggle to read. Um, and it's something that we can teach them how to do. More difficult for some than others, but we can do it. I like that, I like that. Uh, uh, Karen, we're coming close to finishing up now. Um, if someone to follow up with you and, and connect or learn more, where would you send them? So great question. And I'm happy you asked me this beforehand because this is, I, I'm, I'm usually so bad at this part. So um, email. So, you know, you know, my email, I don't know if you put it at the uh, the bottom, but it's karen.gazette at hotmail.com. So, you know, certainly interested in, um, I, I love this work. This is, you know, this is my passion. So love to do as much of it as possible. Um, I have a site teachingmeanslearning.com. And then all of the usual LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook, uh, you know, I can be found using my name. Very nice. And I'll put that information in the show notes so people can find it and, and reach out to you. Uh, I got uh, two last questions for you. And the, the first one uh, just goes like this. How do you keep going when so much is going on that you may want to quit? So I get inspired by teachers because when teachers are able to support students, the joy in their faces when they've taught somebody how to read or master a skill gives me joy. So it really is, you know, just teachers, the commitment that teachers have and how excited they are when they have taught kids how to break that code. Um, and, then, and then students, right, how joyful they feel when they're learning how to read. Um, so that's, that's what keeps me going. That's what I find inspiring. Love it. I love it. Uh, last question. Do you have a teacher in your past who made a difference in your life? If so, who was it? And what would you say if given the chance to say thank you? So it's funny because I, I had a university teacher who is now a close friend and I've said thank you to her a million times. So I feel fortunate that I've been able to do that. But this university teacher, her name is Evelyn Lusthaus. And what, what was so beneficial was when I started university, this was the my master's degree, she gave a name to something I was feeling. And all of us felt the same way. We all believed in inclusion of kids with, who struggle. We just didn't know that it had a name. And when we started talking about inclusive education and the importance of including kids who, who struggle and have difficulty and, you know, for many different reasons, it was very empowering. Um, and then what to do about it. So just, and then we sort of became a group of like-minded people who were committed to supporting students in the classroom. Um, but bringing us together, giving it a name, empowering us with the feeling that we're all capable and we can all make a difference for kids. That is so cool. So awesome. I, 
Karen, th- thank you so much for talking with me about your book, The Power of Effective Reading Instruction, How Neuroscience Informs Instruction Across All Grades and Disciplines. Love the focus. Awesome book. Thought generator. Practice changer. Love it. Wishing you the best <laughs> in all you, you do. Thank you so much. It's been great talking with you. Hey, you have been listening to Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12, a podcast to help you help kids achieve their dreams. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the Education Podcast Network. Podcasts for educators, podcasts by educators. Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 is a member of the podcast network based in Canada called Voice Ed Radio. Voice Ed Radio, your voice is right. The opinions expressed on Teaching, Learning, Leading K-12 are those of the guests and hosts. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is intended to share ideas, advice, and suggestions. Teaching Learning Leading K-12 is produced for educational purposes. Hey, thanks for listening. It would be awesome if you visited my website at stephenmaletto.com and connected with me, left a review, and listened to more episodes. And by the way, you could also share it with your friends, with your family, and uh, your colleagues. Thanks so much. You're awesome.